Uh, my name is Arushi Bhatnagar. Uh, I work with the Public Health Foundation of India as a consultant uh, where we are providing assistance to the government of Nagaland for uh, designing an evaluation and a baseline assessment of uh, multi-sectoral health water and sanitation project. So just to very briefly tell you what I'll be talking about, uh, to begin with, just to give a very you know, rudimentary sense of what exactly ec economics does in the health sector, uh, then talk about what exactly are demand for health services, how do we produce and supply them, and then a very, again, a very bird's eye view of uh, what are the different market models. And then we'll hopefully break into small groups where you could discuss a couple of themes based on um, some of the topics that I've touched upon in right now. So what exactly do economists even do in the health sector, right? Um, so economists in general, by profession, I guess, are concerned with allocation of resources between competing demands. Now we know that we don't live in a perfect world where our demands, which are fairly infinite at times, match up with all the resources that are available. So there is a shortage or there is a very acute scarcity of the resources that are available to us. Specifically in the health sector and more particularly in the context that we live in and work in in low and middle income countries, the scarcity is even more acute, thereby making it even more challenging to decide how best to use uh, the resources that are available to us. Um, furthermore, it's also important to decide who makes these choices. You know, as a society, do we leave it to um, the market where the forces of demand and supply which determine price on their own decide how we should use these resources or should it be something more planned, you know, presumably by the government where you're deciding uh, um, how much money should be taken from citizens, how it should be allocated between different social and other economic goods. We're also very uh, interested in trade-offs, right? So in economics, a lot of times we think in terms of substitution or in terms of trade-offs. Do we want efficiency versus equity? Um, how do we get? How do we obtain an optimal combination of the two? So by efficiency, so for example, do we simply want to improve uh, or achieve better health, or do we also care for making sure that there is a fairer distribution or a more equitable distribution of health? And finally, economics allows us with a set of tools um, that help policymakers, or that could potentially help policymakers to decide how best to make these choices, right? What should be done? And this is again something that we will discuss in much greater detail towards the second part of the day. Um, so now, just to start with, you know, a very basic fundamental principle in economics: uh, demand. Um, so a demand for any good really depends upon. Uh, the person who's consuming it, their preferences as well as their ability and willingness to pay for it. Um, demand depends on a bunch of factors, most importantly the price at which you are, which it is available to you. So as a consumer, you would obviously want more for a good that is um, for which the price is lower. Right? Now in addition, and that is something that is represented by this downward uh, sloping demand curve. Demand not only depends, demand for a good not only depends on its own price, but it also depend on price of maybe the substitutes good or near perfect substitute goods. Um, for example, let's for example assume that a Crocin and a Brufin work the same for you if you have a severe headache, right? And you go to the market and you find that on the day that you have a headache, the price of Brufin is actually much higher than the price of Crocin. It's likely that you will actually take Crocin, assuming that you know, they work the same for you. Um, so with, uh, with an increase in the price of the substitute good, the demand for, your, for the original good actually goes up. Um, similarly, price of complementary goods, right? Goods that go hand in hand. Um, needles and syringes in the context of health. Um, so the price of one will automatically also, I mean, a reduction in the price of a complementary good would also um, improve or Im increase the demand for the original good. Um, income, how much we earn also influences our ability to pay but in particular, right? So if our income increases, our demand for a certain product may or may not increase. There are again certain kinds of products that you may not really want to use, right? If your income increases, you may prefer to buy a car rather than take an auto every day. So again, there are certain kinds of good but in general you imagine uh, for a normal good that your demand for it will increase with 
the increase in your income. And finally, tastes, right? What some of our habits, some of our social context that we're just used to. Um, we may prefer eating rice to chapatis, or we may, you know, prefer walking in a. If you live in, say, a mountainous area, you may prefer um, to walk rather than go on, say, an animal carted vehicle. So, just some of our some of our internal preferences. Um, so, is demand for healthcare different? Um, well, honestly, yes and no, and maybe I'll start with the no first, right? So, in some sense, it's actually very, it is not the same, right? Because when we are in, when we're talking about healthcare, there's a lot of information asymmetry. By that, I mean that as a consumer, as a patient, I don't really know what my problems are or what treatment I should get give myself, right? It's, it's the information that the doctor gives me that I rely on. So there is another person who is making the decision for me, who is just telling me what I should be consuming. And that sort of takes me away from the price that I would be, or the decision of the price that I would like to pay. So there is, you know, there is the presence of other people making decisions. Similarly, if you happen to be extremely ill or it's a matter of life and death, again, you, you may not be you know, physically in the capacity to make a decision for yourself. And that is, again, sometimes when you either rely on your doctors or on members of your family or friends to make that decision for you. So in that sense, you know, there's a disconnect between the actual producer and the, uh, at the actual consumer and the price that he or she is facing. Um, and again, in, just adding on to that, there's also the presence of other parties, right? Sometimes you may know that you may actually have the information, but you may not have the ability to pay for uh, health care, in which case you may rely on government subsidies or you may have insurance that allows you to enjoy services that you're not directly, in some sense, directly paying for, right? So again, there is somebody in the middle who is helping you in this process of deciding how much you should consume for the price that is available to you. Um, and this is also in particular to our life cycle. I mean, presumably when we are younger, we are working and hence earning more, possibly also healthier and may not really need health care as much as compared to when we are older. Uh, and you know, at that time retired and not really having a source of income. So there has to be a mechanism by which you can, you know, distribute the resources that you earn at an earlier stage, but use them at a later stage as vis-a-vis -vis your demand for healthcare services, which you may not have at an earlier stage, but you may have at a later stage. Um, and finally, to some extent, I mean, do we really enjoy health services? Like, our, you know, is our demand for, say, food the same as our demand for health? We don't really want to go to a doctor. We don't really want to be sick, right? So in that sense, healthcare is actually a very different good altogether. Um, Having said that, there are also some services which are probably exactly like any other normal good, like food. I may want glasses to improve, um, you know, quality of my reading or my dentist told me the other day that I need braces because my teeth don't look good or something like that, right? So again, these are things that I could live without, they're not essential, but I would possibly pay for them if the price for those, I mean, I would want more of them if the price for those are less. So in that sense, they're also fairly they are also what we call normal goods. Now, why is it important to understand demand, right? Um, essentially, it's, a, it's an ability for the system to predict the changes in behaviors and reactions. Now, what if you introduce a use of fees for, you know, what if your local doctor suddenly tells you that, uh, you know, he's going to charge you more for a consultation fees, in which case, are you still going to go to him? Um, would you change to another doctor? Would you go to him less? Maybe you're going to him twice a year, but now you might just go once a year. So it helps to understand how your behaviors and your reactions are changing. Alternately, if you suddenly abolish, you know, your d private doctor tells you he's not going to charge you anything, maybe you'll just go to him every, you know, month. So in that sense, it helps you, it helps us to understand how people would react to these changes in prices. Um, and come and sort of building on that, it's important to understand how consumers value services, right? Presumably, if you have a demand for a certain service, you have a higher demand, might mean that you value that service more. And that's a very important uh, understanding that we need to have in order to decide what services we should really produce. Again, especially since we have a scarcity of resources and we need to make um, an efficient judgment of how to use them. 
Um, there's another concept in um, economics, it's called elasticity, uh, which essentially tries to understand um, proportionate changes in the quantity that you demand uh, de uh, um, relative, relative to the proportionate change in price, in the case of price elasticity and income in the case of income elasticity. So for example, if, if the quantity that you demand decreases uh, smaller in compared to a change in price, it's likely that you don't really care for the change in price. You would still consume that good, right? This, and this is what we call an inelastic good. Um, alternately, if, you, if the change in price makes the quantity demanded highly responsive, is what we call an elastic good. Um, there's a whole lot of literature on this and I wish we could you know, spend more time on it, but just basically to give you an overall sense that in general a lot of empirical evidence on this issue finds that health care is an inelastic good, right? Like if you need health care, you will probably go ahead and demand it or consume it irrespective of the price that you are facing. Um, now this has very important implications because what do you do in cases where, um, like I was talking about user fees, right? Now if does, will that deter people from using services? Is there specific kinds of people who it would deter? Maybe those who have lower incomes would not necessarily like to go to, um, would like to demand services when a user fees is charged as compared to those who may have higher incomes. Now sort of moving on to the other side, right? How do we, how do we actually produce these services? What goes into, what are the decision making uh, that is required for the production? Um, before I start that, there's a very important fundamental principle in economics called efficiency, right? Essentially means how do we get the best from what we have. Um, there, are different t there are different kinds of efficiencies. I will just very briefly talk about two main ones, the technical and economic. So technical efficiency is essentially producing most output from a set of inputs or producing a set of set amount of output using as few inputs as you can, right? So imagine a primary health care center where you know that if you have one doctor and three nurses, you can produce or you can give 20 consultations in an OPD clinic. Um, but let's say in this PHC you actually find that there are, they've hired three doctors and five nurses. So we know that somewhere this is an inefficient allocation of resources. They've hired, they've got more people doing less amount of work, right? Um, economic efficiency is similar, it's, but instead of thinking in terms of outputs, it thinks more in terms of cost. So again, let's imagine that in this PHC you know that a combination of one doctor and three nurses can produce 20 consultations as as well as a combination of two doctors and two nurses right they both both sets of human resources can produce the same amount technically i'm mean, sorry efficiently um, but we also know that it's likely that the salaries of doctors are higher than the salaries of nurses in which case the first set where you have lesser doctors and more nurses is probably more economically efficient um, so what exactly goes into the production of healthcare, right? What are the inputs? So we obviously need our doctors, nurses, midwives, lab technicians, pharmacists, but we also need a set of semi-skilled staff who are providing them supportive services. So we need, you know, health attendants, we need uh, diagnostic attendants, we need sweepers, we need uh, people who are manning or guarding these health, um, health facilities. We also obviously need infrastructure, um, we need equipment, drugs, consumables, um, energy, water um, and in addition we also need some sort of invisible inputs such as you know in addition to having clinical skills you also need to have like it's like it's better if our healthcare providers also have interpersonal or caring skills. There's a certain amount of teamwork between the people who are providing services, they are motivated. Then how do we actually choose between these factors, right? Should we have, I mean, do we use all of them? Do we use them in certain combinations? Do we only use one? So again, like with any other things, we need a certain combination uh, of inputs that will help us to produce health services. Um, typically, we can think of it in terms of labor. Sorry, we can think of it in um, terms of labor like person weeks and then we can think of it in terms of capital so for example let's say cycles um, 
I'll give sort of an example of, um, I'll just give an example here, right? So imagine that you need uh, bicycles in order to, you need both bicycles and healthcare providers to immunize children in a remote setting, right? Now, obviously, having more than 10 bicycles and having with only zero health staff doesn't make sense because unfortunately we don't have really cool robotic bicycles yet. Um, and similarly, you don't, you know, we don't need more than 10 people and no bicycles. You could theoretically, of course, still provide the services, but we think, imagine a setting where it's very difficult for someone to actually physically walk, right? Um, so in that sense, you do need a combination. And this curve right here basically gives you the base, all possible combinations of the labor and which is the uh, health worker and the bicycles capital that can help you to produce thousand children right uh, sorry thousand immunized children but at the same time there is a certain amount of substitution right which is what is represented by this downward sloping curve so in order to have more of one you are likely to give up having less of the second input uh, so it just again think of it in terms of should we have more skill staff uh, to provide services or should we hire less skilled staff but give them more supervision or give them more training you know those are the kind of choices we have to make do we use more diagnostic equipment or should we use uh, inst you know more diagnostic equipment with one lab technician or should we use you know maybe one basic lab uh, equipment but more lab technicians in addition to providing a technically efficient combination, we also need to provide services that are also minimizing the cost of production, right? which are also economically efficient. Uh, and this is a, again a very important um, principle because it allows us to understand how these services are actually supplied. Right Now, presumably someone who is producing these services, whether it is a healthcare provider or whether it is a pharmaceutical company, they would want to maximize the profits that they can earn, right? Now, they will only be able to do that if they are producing at the lowest cost that is uh, that they can, given the inputs that they have. Um, again, getting into understanding what kinds of costs there are in economics and how we actually calculate them, it will probably take us weeks. So I won't really get into that. But just to again give you that the most guiding principle is that you won't produce more if you're, you know, you won't produce an additional unit if you, the cost of producing that exceeds it, right? And that in some sense will then give you a upward sloping supply curve, right? Where suppliers or producers or pharmaceutical companies, healthcare providers would want to pr uh, provide more at uh, higher prices. Now I would just like to talk about what we mean in markets. Um, so a market brings together the demand for goods from consumers and the supply of those goods from the suppliers. So we have basically we've talked about each of them separately but now just to see how they come together. Markets help to decide what to produce and how to produce it. Now in, so when we were discussing demand we knew that uh, you would demand some, the demand that you have for a good also in a sense tells you about the value for the services that you are demanding, right? So that helps the market to decide what should be produced, which services should be given priority. Um, and how to produce, um, again knowing that um, given the self-interest of wanting to make profits, you know that you want to produce it at the lowest possible cost and that, uh, that allows you to decide how you want to actually produce these services. Um, and as we discussed, consumers will obviously want to buy more if the price is lower, but suppliers would want to sell if the price is higher. Now this, thankfully, at least in economics, we understand it to reach a stage of equilibrium where demand and supply forces uh, balance out each other um, to come to sort of an equilibrium price, an equilibrium state where you have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity demanded. Now, the way we understand it is that unless you don't reach this particular stage, then the choices or the preferences of both the consumers and the suppliers don't coincide, right? So let's say for example, you have um, a situation where you have excessive medical students who are being 
produced in a country right it's very rare but let's go with that um so you will have at say price p3 you have a, you have excess medical students who are getting into the industry now but at price 3 at p3 the demand for the medical services is actually lower right it's here as compared to the supply which is here um so at this price it's likely that these medical students would have to accept jobs where they are not really getting paid as much as they would like or as much as before if they were here so this sort of pushes the market to reduce the price to come back to p1 now in an alternate situation let's say you and which is actually the more real uh, life example in our settings is that you have a shortage of um you have a shortage of medical students who are entering the system uh, relative to the demand that we have for medical services in that case there will be an excess amount of demand as compared to the supply and in this case those who are providing the services are likely to increase the price which then brings you back up to this particular state of equilibrium there are different market models um again it's not something we'll really go into but just to give you a sense that there's a range you can have a situation where you have perfect competition right which essentially means that you have many sellers and many buyers you have a product that is completely homogenous everyone is a price taker no one can really influence the price themselves or you have a pure monopoly or a pure monopoly which i didn't put but where you only have one supplier or you only have one buyer so they have total control over um uh, the decisions of making price of setting the price um so for example you need to have perfect information across all buyers and sellers right so everybody should know um what everybody should know about the products everybody should have perfect information about the services that they want or the services that they are producing um there should there shouldn't be any informational cost right so you shouldn't have to spend um money to tell a, to uh, pay to a doctor to tell you what treatment um that you really need um secondly you need to have a large number of buyers and sellers so a situation where no one person so no one pharmaceutical company can decide the price or no one consumer of that drug can decide the price now this is essential because if you don't have the situation and instead you only have a small number of buyers it's likely that they can themselves influence the price but if there's a large number then it's very possible that if someone is trying to charge more that particular you know firm or person has to it will either be forced to leave the market or will uh, lower his or her price the uh, same things for uh, buyers right if you if there is a if there are large number of buyers you on your own can't negotiate or can't decide that um you want to pay only a certain price for the demand that you, the quantity that you want secondly there should be a homogeneity of product meaning it should be the same right you shouldn't have different people providing different services um and you should have free entry and exit for all players there shouldn't be any regulations uh, there shouldn't be any obstacles that are preventing new suppliers or so new say new drug companies or new providers to enter the market um i don't know if anything that i'm saying is sort of making you wonder how this actually works in um real life in any case and in particular in the case of healthcare uh, it doesn't this is a fairly hypothetical situation but it also helps us to come up i mean as a model it helps us to critique what is different in reality so we'll stop here for now and break into small groups um what we what we would like you to do is maybe get into groups of four of five people each uh, we have two topics here um one is what are the demand and supply side factors which influence utilization of institutional delivery in india and discuss from an economic perspective how interventions under nrhm national oh, sorry should be nhm now address these factors and the second is why is there a shortage of health workers in india why are health workers often absent from their positions in rural areas again discuss from an economic perspective how interventions under the national health mission aim to address these challenges so maybe two groups can take on the first topic and the other two groups can take on the second topic 
you take about 15 minutes to talk amongst yourselves, come up with a list of demand side and supply side factors based on what you have understood from some of the concepts that I was trying to explain um, and list it out and then we can come back as a group and um, discuss them further.